Well, thank you and welcome. Uh, my name is Rob Mackey. I'm the project manager for the Viva Gas Terminal project. Um, and I really appreciate everybody coming out today to learn more about our project. Um, we've got a, an environmental expert, Jeff, who's going to run us through the, the technical aspect today. Um, uh, but before we get into all that, I'd just like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today here in Geelong. That's a Wadawurrung people. Um, pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping things. We're going to film today so that people who can't make it, and we've had a few apologies, um, so then we can, we can put that on the, on the net and, and people can watch it afterwards. Hopefully that's not an issue for, for anybody. Um, from a facilities point of view, I think it's out the corner, Joe, and to the right, just around there. Um, but by all means, you know, ask heaps of questions today. You can ask Jeff, sort of more of the environmental type technical ones, but anything general for the project, hopefully I can answer them, or, or Joe, we've got Jacqueline here as well. What have I missed, Joe? Just a high-level introduction to the gas terminal and how it's going. Yeah. Okay. Like this I like the poster to talk to. All right. Like the All right. <coughs> Is it okay if we ask questions as we go rather than? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff will be fine. So maybe when Jeff's talking, ask him to Jeff, and then you can ask me any now if you'd like to, or, or at the end. Um, I like to keep it relatively straightforward when I'm talking about our projects. So I talk four major pieces of scope. The first is the floating gas terminal, the FSRU, it's the ship that will be permanently moored outside the refinery adjacent to us. It will be moored at a, a, refinery, a new refinery pier extension, a new jetty. So at the moment we've got four berths at the refinery. We're proposing to put a fifth berth to the north of the existing facilities. Then we'll have a treatment facility within the fences of the refinery. Um, we'll have nitrogen injection in there, which is essentially to dilute any rich gas, to make the, the gas spec for Victoria, and some odorant so that if there is a leak or you know, in our house we know that when the gas is on, that familiar smell. The pipeline is around about six and a half kilometres long. Two and a half kilometres of that is from the, the gas terminal across the new jetty, across our existing jetty, across the refinery or above ground, about two and a half kilometres, to the treatment facility, after which it does some existing pipeline easements out to Lara and there's a the Victorian transmission system is out there as you come into Geelong for those who are familiar you, on the freeway you, you dip down it's up on the left in the fence so so it's about four kilometers from from the refinery site and we'll be following pipeline easements so there that's our proposed project um, might hand it over to, to you Jeff much for coming today everyone that's really appreciated so my name is Jeff Smith I work for a company called ACOM and we're an independent environmental and engineering company so we're not part of Viva we're doing an independent assessment of this project for Viva and the work that we do has to pass through all of the regulatory processes with government to get approvals so it's an independent piece of work and it has to stand up to scrutiny of technical committees and government departments and ultimately a panel inquiry. So just to give you some comfort that we are independent and what we do, our reputation rests on us being able to develop meaningful environmental responses for these projects so that um, they can get through regulatory approvals. So I'll quickly touch on where we are and what we're doing. If we could just, thanks Sue, to the next slide. Um, these probably aren't very clear, but this is a very simplified view of what's called the environment effects statement process. So Viva has been requested by the Minister to prepare an environment effects statement, which is the ultimate sort of approval, I guess, in Victoria for projects that have a major potential impact. I don't think you'll be able to read all of that, unfortunately. It looks blurry to me. Is it blurry to you folks? Yeah, sorry, so it's not my eyes, which are getting worse by the, the year. But um, So I'll just try and quickly cover the, the top orange box there really is the process where Viva went through to refer their project to the Minister to say, hey Minister, we think our project may have some potential impacts. Could you advise us on whether we need to do an environment effects statement? The Minister subsequently said, yes, you will need to do one. 
And the next box down is what's called scoping of the ES. So the minister basically releases to Viva a series of guidelines about what, in this case, he would expect to be in the environment effects statement. So a whole series of studies and requirements for Viva to go through to assess the impacts of their project. We're now in, we're still waiting, I should say, the scoping requirements have been on public um, advertisement for a period of time and they, I think they come off Monday next week, Jacqueline, is it? Or 17th. 17th, whenever that is. So if you did want to make any comments on the scope, the draft scope that the Minister has put out, i.e. if you wanted to input something to say, Minister, we think Viva should study X or Y or should give consideration to whatever, you can make those submissions up till the 17th if you wanted to do that. I suggest you go on to the DELP website, uh, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. I'll call them DELP from now on. But you can access um, that through there and if you wanted to make a submission, you could. Where we're going now is the next phase of preparing the ES. So that's the stage we're in where we're doing lots of studies. So we're not here today to be able to tell you a lot of findings yet. We've started on a whole lot of studies that have to be done basically to then get the findings to assess whether there will be impacts with this project. So this is a fairly, this is sort of occupying maybe six or eight months of our time because a lot of the studies are quite detailed and need to be quite thorough in their investigation. The final, or sorry, the second last box is what we call the exhibition of the EES. And this is where you folks have a really strong opportunity to again get involved if you wanted to. So when the, when the Department of Environment signs off on the EES that says Viva has done a thorough and professional job of that EES, it goes on to public exhibition. And it's usually exhibited for, well, it might be up to 40 business days, so you get quite a lot of time between 30 and 40 business days to have a read of the EES, to read the executive summaries if you're not inclined to want to read the whole document, to read all the specialist studies if you want to read any of those, Bigger the ES is normally, like what you said, 40 days. Uh, they're horribly thick. So that's not a lot, <laughs> not a lot of time then, 40 <coughs> days, if you've got a big, big document. Well, well, it's 40 business days, so I guess it's, you know, four or five weeks. But yes, it is. It, it's quite challenging. And um, what I'd suggest is that Viva will be running more of these sessions. Joe's group will be. And, that, and that's an opportunity where some of the experts will be on hand to be able to maybe simplify and explain the complex bits a bit more so that you don't necessarily have to wade through everything. You might get a sense from the experts and then you can make submissions if you wanted to. But yeah, it is. In 40 days, you'll be running more consultation processes. We will during the 40 days, but also in the lead up. So as we're getting material, we will be sharing the findings as we progress. It won't be just wait for 40 days. Yeah, and unfortunately, I can't tell you that they're not big, long technical documents. They are. And the studies are fairly technical too, so it is a challenge for the community to understand sometimes. I, I think it is a weakness of our system. But one thing the Minister did, and this is the first time we've ever seen this for the Viva one, is the Minister outlined what he called primary issues of concern and secondary issues of concern. So the primary ones we're going to touch on today, but what that means is for some of them we won't do as much study because we don't think we need to, or the Minister doesn't think we need to, because they may be of fairly low impact. So for instance, take visual impact. With the refinery and its existing setting, a lot of the infrastructure for this project is within the refinery. So you might argue that there's not a massive visual, visual impact perhaps, as, as one example. Um, but there are other studies which are much more significant in terms of potential environmental impacts. So, but that phase of the, of the EES is where you can make submissions to the EES, and you can make submissions on anything, any topic you like. And the Minister usually sets up what's called an independent panel inquiry, where effectively he asks that inquiry to review all the submissions that come in and to provide him with an independent report to assist him in making his assessment of the project, which is the last box. And the Minister uses all of that, all of the community input, all the technical studies, and then makes a decision on whether the project should proceed or not proceed. So I'd urge you to keep in touch with, with Viva through the process and when we get to this phase, by all means, please feel free to make submissions and bring forward issues. And, yeah. Sorry, I'll ask you the questions along the way. Please do. 
Would, could, would it be possible that you would say in the EES, I, we think this is going to have too large an impact, and then you'll say to Beva and the Minister, we don't think you should go ahead with this? And, uh, and second question to that, if there are no submissions made, can the Minister still say, no, we don't think it's a good idea because it's going to have too much environmental impact? Yep. Without us? yep. The submissions are just one input. The technical studies are a primary one. The submissions are a secondary one. The Minister likes to know what the community's feeling and so on. Um, but to your answer, yes, definitely the Minister can make a decision without any community um, submissions. It doesn't happen, of course, because the community generally do. But um, to, to answer your first question, uh, it's a very, very good question, because if we as independent consultants assessing this say to Viva, the impacts of, let's take it hypothetical, your air discharge is outside of the EPA levels, then we would go back to Viva and say, you need to modify your design. You need to do something extra to bring it down to a level compliant with EPA. So Viva would then go away and perhaps put an extra scrubber or a filter or something into their process. We then measure it again and see what that is. So that's a you know, really important question about how this process works. And then if Viva you know, wasn't able to, they might have to do something fairly radical to their design to, to bring it into compliance. But the whole process is to study, find out what the impacts look like. If they're unacceptable, go back and redesign or come up with a new measure to manage it. And then ultimately Viva makes a call on when they're going to say, right, that's it. We're putting it up to the minister. So very rare that a, a proponent would go forward with something that you know, is radically unacceptable, for instance. OK, well, any questions on the process? So, so with this scoping stage, we've only really had three weeks to look at the documents, which is not a great deal of time for community when we're all busy and working people. You know, we have to fit this in around our lives. Um, I understand from Delp that um, there is a possibility for us still to raise issues around the scoping document even after this period. Is that correct? I can't speak on behalf of Delp, but usually they're quite open to anyone, you know, suggesting issues or things that should be covered. They may not end up in the scoping document itself. But to give you some comfort, the scoping documents are quite broad. So they will say you've got to study the marine issues like we're doing, talking about today. And usually that's pretty all-encompassing. So, But the other vehicle is we, as, as the team, are very open to you know submissions or um, you coming to us and saying we're a bit worried about this issue. Would you mind taking it on board and having a think about it? So you can raise issues with us any time. And I think that's a misconception maybe about the EES process sometimes that everyone scurries off and puts arms around things and does it all in isolation. Not at all. I mean, Joe's team is open to you providing submissions at any time on issues that you want us to look at and we can incorporate them into our sort of thinking around the studies. So don't panic too much on that. Just one question there. What I was um, uh, confused about, you've got a community booth at Westfield on the 17th of June. Mm -hmm. On the 12th of July, you've got your gas terminal safety session. Now, if you've got the community booth one on and people ask about gas terminal safety, how can they get answers if the, your next session is after that? Joe, can I defer to you? Absolutely. So, in terms of those community booths, they're set up at the shopping centres for people to come and ask questions about any topic. Uh, and absolutely will answer them to the best of our ability as to where we are to in terms of the studies. The session that is focused on safety will be a bit like today where we will have experts who are here to talk specifically around safety. And as part of this stage of the project, we're doing safety studies and assessments yep. and we'll, we'll line that data up post those assessments being done so we've got more to talk about at that session there. So we've been quite specific. Let's get along here. We will have done quite a lot of work. We have the experts and we can talk very generally and specific, well, broadly and specifically about safety there. So is that at every level of safety from the plant through to the environment? C, plant, environment, safety cross and for workers? Yeah, it's, it's probably more on the, the personnel and process safety as opposed to this one's more environmental today. Right. So that, that one will come on the 
Fourth of July? You said, yeah, I think that's a, the date there. Yep. So that one will cover all those questions I've asked? Personal and process safety, yep. Yeah. yep. And then the community one will be more general. Yep, because if you ask me today, for example, about the, the size of a fire that could come out of a, an LNG carrier that's four inches in diameter, we won't have that detail, but by then we will have that detail. So, so we the, pro the process is still really just starting. Yeah, so we're, we're doing quite a lot of engineering at the moment. So Jeff's team's out there doing these environmental studies. And we've got another team from Wally who are doing the, the technical and the engineering studies about the pipeline and how many <coughs> nitrogen tanks we need and how do you design your jetty and the pipelines that are going across the jetty and the weight and all of that. That's all going on as well. And part of that is these safety studies. And you generally do them once you've got your design at a level where you're quite confident of it. And then you, you undertake those safety studies. And, yeah, thank you. And coming back to Jeff's point earlier, what we want to do is share the information as we're getting it. So you don't have to wait till the final years is printed. So that's why we will be having focus sessions as yeah. those studies results are available. Okay, and the, the, um, just going back, as far as people responding, what was it, responding to what's already happened, I think just in a few days' time with the cutoff. That, that's for comments around the EDS scope, but it's the official cutoff. But as Jeff said earlier, if you've got comments yeah. or thoughts, by all means, you can, you can come and ask via our website. Jeff indicated that DELP are open anyway um, for comments, so... get it in in the next few days? For, for the scoping requirements, the formal process that the Department of Environment run, yes. For the informal process, if you contacted Rob or Joe or myself at some point in a month's time and said, we just would like you to you know, consider this issue or are oh, your studies going to cover that issue, we'll take that on board. Obviously, they're running parallel. Yeah. The scoping has to have a, a finish because the minister, after the 17th, some point after them, will issue Viva with the formal EES scope that they have to uh, cover in their studies. So that is a formal cut-off, but the idea of if, if issues emerge in the next period of time, next eight months or so while we're doing the EES, we're open to you know, anything you want to bring to us. Are you yeah. obliged to then take that on, though, or not? It's, well, it's not a case of obliged. It's just um, sensible. You know, some, you know, using an example of, say, local bird observer clubs and things often have good data that may or may not have been in the public arena, and someone might come forward in a month's time and say, hey, we've got a count from, you know, November last year that we think would be good input to your study. It makes common sense to take that on board and bring it into the... So, you know, is Viva obliged to? No. Would they as a good corporate citizen? Absolutely. And for us as an environmental consultant, it, the more we get, the better. Yeah, so please do bring things forward. Genuinely, we will consider them and if they're not already covered in our studies, we'll consider the implications of those and, you know, build them in. Can we go to the next slide, Sue? Thank you. Um, so we t we're here today just to talk about the marine stuff, but oh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Rob's probably covered this slide, so if anyone's got any other questions on the actual facility itself, I'll move forward. So is everyone happy with... So is that literally the whole area that's going to be constructed? That what we're watching, looking at there, is that whole area to be no. constructed? No. The I'll let Rob... Yeah. To explain yeah. that too. So the, the bits that will be constructed are the, the new jetty extension. Yeah. So we've already got this existing refinery bit. So it's that jetty extension, and then the pipeline will run all the way along that and across the refinery. And then there'll be the treatment facilities here, and then the underground pipeline. But what's out in the ocean there is all not that's not existing. That's to be. The, this piece. Yes. That, yeah. that? That's there at the moment. So the refinery pier, we've got four berths, one, two, three, four, where these two ships are. 
And then we're putting on this new arm off the existing refinery pier. So where's the actual gas and then this storage is, facility? That, that's it, that's the gas terminal, which is a ship. It's so an FSR. Which is here. Yep, so it'll, it'll come in and permanently moor on this new jetty. Okay. And then we'll bring in LNG carriers, which will come alongside, discharge their LNG, right. then they'll sail away, and the FSRU will mm. remain. What big is that? We'll have quite a visual, visual impact. Having said that, that's <laughs> a visual impact. Yeah. So these ships will be around 300 metres long, wow. about 50 metres wide. The existing, which is a bit bigger than the existing ships that come into the pier, and the, the biggest ones come in around 275 metres and 48 metres wide or something like that. There will be significant dredging though, won't there? There will be some localised dredging, essentially where these two ships are, and a little bit out here so that they can get around refinery pier and manoeuvre in. So yeah, there, there will be dredging required there, um, but there won't be any dredging required around the existing berths or any of the channel. And again, we'll study the impact, well, Jeff's team will study the impact of that dredging and understanding the hydrology of the sands and where they'll move and the currents and the tides. And where will those spoils be deposited? Uh, ideally, in the dredged spoil grounds within Port Phillip Bay. So we're working with VRCA at the moment, so there's an area around Point Wilson where dredged spoil has historically been taken and there's space there at the moment, so you've just got to work through that process of, of getting approval to do that. Back to Jeff. Thanks, Rob. Next one, so thank you. I won't, we can go to the next slide, it's the same thing, just in a map, basically. So if we can just go to the next. So just quickly, today I mentioned we're talking just about mainly the marine study, so we're not covering everything that's in the EES, but I won't go through all of those, but I'll give you just a minute to look at what the sort of topics that the EES is going to cover. So it obviously does the marine things which we're here today about, but it does a lot of other things as well looks at air quality and noise and traffic and all the other issues that the Minister will consider when looking at the whole potential impacts of this project. So there are going to be studies basically on all of those topics that are up there at the moment. So I'll let you quickly have a skim of that. And Can I just ask a question on point C? What's involved there? Are you looking just at the impact of I guess, what you're doing, or are you looking at the global impact? Uh, it's the impact. impact. Because I understand the state of trying to reduce CO2 emissions by 50% by 2030. So I'm just wondering whether that's going to be discussed at the point of C. It will be. I mean, the. the the Minister requires us to look at the greenhouse implications of the project. So it's not talking about Latrobe Valley or whatever, it's looking at the project and what greenhouse gas emissions will that contribute to the state. So it, it is one of those important areas. So that, that'll be the burning of the gas in our homes? No, it doesn't cover those, what they call scope three issues. So it doesn't cover the actual activity of the extraction of the, of the gas at the outset, but it does cover the, you know, the transportation, the production, the, the um, processes that are used to regasify, the embedded energy in the materials that are used for construction, etc. So it will come up, our study will come up with how much greenhouse gas this project will generate. And that then goes to the Minister to say whether that's an acceptable or unacceptable outcome in the in the wider context. It's pretty limited really in its scope, isn't it? Because the main impacts is what's coming out at the end in terms of greenhouse gas. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's a major problem with the scope of the ES. As a yeah, well, scope three is a big issue because, you know, we're gradually moving towards a decarbonised world. We must get there immediately. Like, we can't move. Well, we can't get there immediately. It's just but these sort of projects are holding us up. Well, that's, yeah, that's philosophical, but I think 
the difficulty is that renewables are not coming online quickly enough and more so the infrastructure in the state isn't up to accepting the amount of renewables that could be bought online. So there is going to be a period of transition between thermal coal, etc., and total renewables. And in that period, whatever that period is and however long it is, and I think, you know, one thing Rob Potts didn't mention is there is going to be a gas shortage in Victoria, I think. Well, there's a lot of debate about that, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, sure there is. is. And, and I'm not here to sort of debate the philosophies of that. I think... It's science. The, um, the regulators and so on are saying there will be, and I think there's a fairly credible body of, you know, evidence that says there will. But I'm not going to debate that today. That's really for the regulators to decide whether a project like this is needed in the state. And so it's kind of beyond the scope of an AES. But yeah, you know, they're real issues. I think, you know, we're all keen to get to it. It's really important. Our community has a very well um, researched and, you know, yeah. well informed debate about this issue because yeah. it's so urgent that we transition as quickly as possible. Sure. And they're good submissions to make into the, to the process, for sure. Yep. So complex, <laughs> A to P. How long do you reckon it's going to take you to make assessments on every single one of those? Probably towards the end of the year is when we're thinking that will have happened. We've already got studies underway, I should say. Studies have been going, and perhaps you know we're talking about A and B today potentially as the main topic. So I can give you a little bit of detail on what we're doing in that at the moment, and have been doing since late last year. Because they're the primary ones. In my opinion they are, and in the Minister's opinion also, the Minister basically said that marine issues and Ramsar wetland issues and greenhouse gas are the three, what he called primary OK, issues. ABC. Yes, but today we're only talking effectively about A and B. There'll be other sessions, as Joe mentioned, on other topics as we go forward, like this, where you can come and talk about safety or other topics. So I don't want to distract today by... Oh, no, 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 not that question, but let's not talk about noise today. We can talk about noise in another session. So, will this be available, this video, on the website or something? Yeah, that's, that's, that's our right. point. Yep, right. OK, well, we'll move to the next slide. That's just to show you the scope, the coverage of the ES. Um, I just wanted to quickly describe the process, because this, if you understand this, you'll sort of understand my next sort of couple of slides. But what we're talking about today here primarily is marine issues. And there are three marine issues associated with these type of facilities. One is called entrainment. And to simplify that, it just means how much sea life do you draw into the FSRU or the gas terminal through pumps pumping in water for the regasification process. And that's predominantly small plankton larvae, you know, small organic biota, etc., that can get drawn in through the pumping process. So that's entrainment. When the regasification occurs, water is obviously pumped back out of the, the facility and that water has chlorine in it and it is also a different temperature to the ambient temperature of Cryo Bay. So they're the three things that are the real sort of potential marine impacts of these sort of projects. And I'll talk about them in a little more detail in a moment, but this just shows you schematically how that works. So that's the vessel that Rob showed you a minute ago that has the regasification facilities on board. Seawater is taken in through a couple of inlets that's pumped into the vessel. It is obviously used in the regasification process. And in other gas projects, um, the discharge is directly out of the vessel. So it just comes regasified and straight out of the vessel back into Cryo Bay. What Viva Energy is proposing to do is in fact to take the water that comes out of the process and it's a colder water, it's cooler than the ambient water and to basically pump it through that orangey colour, if it is orangey to you, um, pipe into the existing refinery intake and as it happens the FSAU basically, or the gas terminal basically pumps out about the same amount of water that Viva is currently drawing out of Corio Bay for its refinery cooling. So it's effectively a reuse and recycling of the water, which means there's only one intake, not two intakes or outputs. So the idea is that that will be pumped into the refinery, be reused in the refinery for cooling purposes, 
and then discharge back out of the existing refinery Into outtakes. Into Cryber. And at the moment, the refinery discharges uh, cooling water into Cryobay under existing EPA licences, which get um, licence temperature and chlorine, etc. It is technical, and I'm... So it's coming out, so if you bring the water from Cryobay onto the big gas facility storage system, doing something with it, oxidising it or whatever, then taking it into the refinery, where it's cooling down, and then dumping it back into the back. Yeah, reusing it. So instead of the refinery continuing its current process of drawing water in, using it for cooling and then discharging it, yeah. the water, water, that water will be replaced by the water coming out of the vessel. So it's a net neutral and it will go into the refinery, do the cooling and then come back out again, which is also net neutral. So the, to give you an idea of temperatures, at the moment if the cryobay was 20 degrees, the refinery would draw in 350,000 cubic metres a day and then discharge that back at about 27 or 28 degrees and has been doing that for 65 years. Yeah. With this, call 350,000 metres cubed a day, the FSRU would use that at 20. It would come out of the FSRU at 13 or 14. We'd put it in that pipe into the refinery at 13 or 14 and it would go back into the Corio Bay at 22 or 23 degrees. Just and above. How many um, are we talking about in that cubic metres? Just so I can sort of get a bit. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to take that one on notice. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of swimming pools. Yeah, so 350,000 cubic metres a day. Yeah. But bearing in mind that's been going on for 60 years. That's, that process. And the chlorine, by the way, just to explain chlorine when we come to it in a minute, the chlorine is really only used as a, um, to stop anti -fa you know, fouling of pipes and pumps with marine organisms and so on. So the chlorine is just used to basically make sure that, that you know, marine life doesn't attach itself to pipes and pumps because it has a habit of using... Does it kill the marine life? Is, is it used then to collect, kill the marine life in the pumps? It, it does, does kill some of it and some of it actually has a survival rate coming through. But that, that's normal. That's what happens in your swimming pool when you put chlorine in. It's to kill off any particular bugs and things that are in the water. So effectively the chlorination is just the same sort of concept, if you like. But is the, in the process, in the internal process, you put chlorine in and it oxidises and, and kills things on it going through the system. When it gets to going back into the bay, is the chlorine level diminished significantly or you know, is it a huge amount of chlorine that's going in, back into the bay? The amounts of chlorine are actually very, very low. Um, very low, in fact lower than drinking water standards. But I'll come to it in a minute, but the issue is more about you know, chlorine in the marine environment is, is a different concept and what does the effect of that chlorine in the marine environment versus in your swimming pool mean? Does it bioaccumulate in mussels, for instance, or does it, is it toxic to fish within a certain zone, etc.? And um, it, it, I'll come to that in a moment, but that's what we're trying to... That, that's the studies, that's what we're trying to ascertain. They are actually very low levels of chlorine, but... And, and for you, you jump into a swimming pool with those levels happily or drink the water happily, but what does that mean for the marine environment? So We're talking about lots of swimming pools. <laughs> no, 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 I'm talking about the actual milligrams per litre dosage. You would swim in the same or, in fact, higher levels of chlorine than... So, but that's not our concern. Our concern is what does it mean for the marine environment? And that's what the Minister's asked us to... To examine. So I might come back to some of those points when we move to the next step. So does everyone sort of understand that? I know it's complicated. You also, Jeff, the video that we're showing earlier, that's also on our website, that shows the process as well, visually, which might help. Yeah. But the, the water itself, the water that comes in from Cryo Bay and, and is used, is really only used to regasify. It's got no other than the chlorine for the anti-fouling, it's got no chemicals or whatever, it's just seawater. It's just used for regasification. And it's the same with the water that currently goes into the refinery, it's just seawater. It has a dose of chlorine, 
But other than that, it's just seawater circulating and back out. So, you get so in terms of what you're doing or what Viva is doing already, um, the water that's going back into the bay is pretty much the same, but a little bit cooler than what you're doing already. Is that right? So the impact is maybe lessened, if I understood that correctly? That's correct. If you believe that warm water discharges are detrimental, then the net result of this process will be Viva's current temperature coming out will reduce mm -hmm. and in, it would be seen as an environmental benefit. And then, but the chlorine level is the same as what's been happening? Well, right? we're modelling that now. That's what all the studies are doing now, is to look at what the chlorine levels will be mm -hmm. as they but agree. But it's currently putting in at a higher level temperature. So at the moment, the discharge in the refinery is higher than what will come out Why? of the bring the levels down anyway if it's going to impact the environment. If it's currently impacting the environment so badly, what, why isn't it already reducing? Because it's using ambient temperature water out of Cario Bay. What we're going to be putting in through this pipeline is a colder water. After the regasification in the vessel, the water becomes cooler than Cario Bay. And so that colder... The yeah, and therefore cooler the going out. Yeah, yeah. Colder so water going down through here and into the refinery. So it has the net effect of reducing the heat of the current discharge by four or five degrees. Okay. So to your point, yeah, it would be an environmental benefit in a... In, in terms of the temperature, but the chlorine factor is the same? Or it'll, it'll be, be similar, similar, but that's what we're studying. I don't want to make comments on the levels yet because we're not at that point of the, yeah. of the studies. But And there are people that say warm water discharges are actually good in some senses because the fish come along and organic growth is often higher and you know so fishermen love warm water has anyone been up to the Newport power station the warmies when there's discharge coming out the fishermen are down there they love it so you know it's but do but you I think, think, you think fishermen will be attracted to come along and do <laughs> fishing around well it won't it'll still yeah possibly I don't know I don't know but we would argue that is an environmental benefit by reducing the current discharge down to a less warm if you like so any more questions on that quickly? Because I'm just conscious of time, we need to quickly... Just one other thing is, the actual um, gasification process is completely contained on the ship. There's no venting or anything like that of the, uh, the gasified LNG. It's not coming out of the top of the ship. No, no the, the LNG will go into the pipeline. Oh, the the regasified LNG will go into the pipeline. And then if there is any what they call boil off gas, we're looking to recycle that through the refinery. Our refinery uses quite a bit of natural gas in our, in our furnaces and the like. So we'd look to use that. Yeah. So once the, the gas is back in the refinery, it's in, the, in its natural gas form, which is then, and that's a different day, different topic. But on, I think on the photo you saw before, there's a gas treatment plant where the gas is brought up to the, the standard of the Victorian requirements and then it's pumped along the pipeline that you saw on the photo up to the connection point near the Princess Freeway. But that's not for today. Um, so Sue, so if we just go to the next slide. I'm sorry this is fairly busy. I, I <laughs> just struggle to, to get all the words down. But if, uh, some of these I've already covered. So what the EES is going to do is assess the impacts on the marine environment and that includes sort of fish, plankton and larvae, which are an important food source in the food chain. And look at those sort of issues in relation to things that are important around the Ramsar wetland. Does everyone know what the Ramsar wetland is? Everyone familiar with that concept? Okay, so Ramsar is nothing magical. It's actually a town in Iran. And in the 1970s, I believe, there was a convention, international convention on wetlands of international significance and countries were asked to nominate their wetlands that they felt met a whole lot of criteria to be internationally significant and that was particularly in relation to migratory birds coming from the northern southern hemisphere during summer and winter. So in Victoria we have a number of them but the one we're topical here is the, the one that is along the western side of um, Port Phillip Bay and on the Ballerin Peninsula. It's a series of discrete bits of wetland. And there is um, around Avalon Beach and um, Lyme Bay and those sort of areas, 
there are patches of what's called Ramsar wetland that display values. They're important roosting grounds and so on for particularly migratory waders from the northern and southern hemisphere. So the federal department is of, of environment is very interested in Ramsar because it's an international obligation Australia has to the, to the treaty and they're very interested in making sure that Ramsar wetland values are not impacted as are our local environment department. So one of the big things we're looking at is really would this facility have any impact on the migratory waders and the habitat and the food chain that supports that, that Ramsar sort of value, if you like. And that's the nub of, of, of our study to a degree. I won't touch on the next dot point or the one after that because Rob's already explained that that's how this process is working. It's just about how we're going to be using that water in the um, refinery. So as I said earlier, if you come down to the one, two, three, fourth dot point, if you can read that, um, we're effectively looking at those three things I mentioned before. So the entrainment, which is the potential drawing in of sea life into the um, facility, or the, the FSIU, and then the chlorine and temperature. So every marine intake around the world is a pumped intake that does draw um, sea life in. So generally only very small sea life. Bigger fish have the ability to move away from that, yep. Yeah, so you've got a very short period of time to do the study, so I assume you're really doing literature reviews from, you know, past things, you know, to, to try and model the impact, yeah, and what's going to happen in Cryo Bay, yeah? Uh, can I explain the entrainment in detail for you, what we're doing? Is that... Yeah, I'm just yeah I'm just not sure what you want to well make ask your question and then okay. that's so, so my question is Cryo Bay has very low flow like we things water goes round and round in Cryo Bay so it's got great capacity for things to build up if we're putting chlorine in there you know the temperature build up all those sorts of things that are supposed to be ameliorated um, yeah so I'm just wondering about you know what evidence base you're using to make your decisions about whether there'll be an impact or not. Like, because you haven't got a lot of time to actually do a study to look at the flows and, you know, within Cariah Bay. Are you basically going to be pulling that data from, you know, previous studies elsewhere to look at impacts? Is that how it will work? Some of it. Some of it, but we've been doing quite a lot of um, marine survey work already ourselves for this specific project. So since about... Um, <coughs> October last year, we've had a um, series of studies in the bay where we're monitoring plankton and larvae movement within Cryo Bay every month at a whole series of locations near the facility and in Cryo Bay to look at the types of plankton and larvae and their distribution. And I, I keep talking about plankton and larvae, but they're a very important part of the food chain. So if you think of um, the Ramsar wetland and the, but perhaps the migratory waders as being part of the upper level of the food chain in this case, then below that you've got lots of fish and smaller fish and smaller fish and ultimately plankton and larvae. So the idea is if any one of those elements of the food chain gets severely impacted, it has impacts on other parts of the food chain. So if we were you know, to have a significant impact on plankton and larvae, that might have an impact on the fish, the small fish, and that in turn might impact on food sources for birds and so on. So that we've been studying out there for quite some time looking at the plankton and larvae as a basis for assessing what's out there, what the current refinery intake and chlorine discharges are doing to that. And we will then model that to look at how that currents and tides. We've been out there monitoring currents, tides, temperatures, um, we've done benthic survey, benthic being seabed surveys of what's out both in the refinery discharge area and the wider cryo bay. So we're going to have a very pretty comprehensive sort of database, but you do always use international literature. And one example of that, and I'm sorry if I get a bit technical here, but I can't help myself, but with the intake, every intake around the world, and if you think of the Wonthaggy desal plant that's down on the coast, that draws water in at you know, significant volumes out of Bass Strait. And that has a, a, like a grid or a grill across the front that's designed to stop bigger things being drawn into it. Obviously, you can't get to a point where it's like fly wire and you, 
that would just wouldn't work. But so that that concept will be applied to the gas terminal as well. But it's internationally accepted by a lot of work done around the world, and particularly by the US EPA, that there should be a velocity of 0.15 in the pumping of water into the intake, and that's accepted internationally now as a velocity which will protect most sea life, other than you know, microorganisms and things. So for small fish and things, that volume of, dish, of um, intake is an accepted international standard, and that's what we'll be working to, and the Victorian EPA has accepted that as the intake guideline as well. So those sort of you know, standards that exist, we will definitely be complying with, but we will have a really big data set as well, local data set. And that's critical for these projects. You can't use data from South America or another similar project. So, yep. And you'll see all of that data. That will be publicly available. Before, before the PS thing, do you, I mean, do you publish it ongoing? Typically, all those studies end up in the big package. That, but what we'll be doing is sessions like this where, you know, we'll come back and we'll actually have a marine expert instead of someone like me standing here who can actually tell you what's what's happening once we've done the study. So the final assessment will be done by who? The final assessment is the Minister for Planning. Yeah. He is he, I'm saying he because it is a he, I'm uh, yeah. using it. He um, is the decision maker for the EES. So the Minister will assess the impacts of this project based on all the technical reports and the community inputs and the panel inquiry findings, etc. And he will then make a judgment about whether he thinks this should go ahead or not. And if it does go ahead, under what sort of conditions would he impose on Viva to allow them to operate? And from there, all of the other approvals that are needed, like an EPA licence and a Marine and Coastal Act permit, etc., can only happen if the Minister gives it a positive uh, outcome. And is that go across federally as well as state? Good question. question. There is another approval required under the, if everyone's ever heard of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is a big mouthful, I'll call it EPBC Act, the federal government has responsibility for what they call matters of national environmental significance, like Ramsar wetlands and other specific species, migratory waders and some terrestrial species. Viva Energy also have to get approval from the Commonwealth related to those specific matters. So there will be a dual approval required. And the Victorian EES process is being used by the federal government to take the findings of that and to make their own assessment under a bilateral agreement that the Commonwealth and the... So state. is it possible there could be um, opposite opinions or <laughs> responses? <laughs> Federally and state? It's possible. They do liaise, obviously, and they do work together. And, um, but if the Commonwealth said this had an unacceptable impact on a particular species that was a matter of significance in, uh, nationally, then... But again, normally what would happen is that if that emerged during our studies, we would say to Viva, this could well have an unacceptable impact on this habitat or something. And Viva would say, oh, OK, well, what can we do about that? Can we move this to over here or so often a lot of these things are iterated out during the design and the ES process because they're very interrelated mm -hmm. so I would hope that if we went to Rob and said hey Rob there's an issue Rob would say well let's go and have a look at how we can either design it out or move something over here so that it's not related to that habitat or whatever it is so I think a good example of that Jeff is the pipeline yeah. route we're out there doing studies that are 50 metres across. So if we were to find something here, well then, but we knew that it was a better option was here, we, we could alter our pipeline alignment to ensure that we don't impact on the environment. So we're, we're doing that now and we'll take the outcomes of those studies in the coming months and, and then finalise exactly where that, that pipeline route is. Is the pipeline like is the pipe like this big or is it the size of the room? It, it's 600 mil, so it's two foot nominally in diameter. Yeah, which isn't unusual with hydrocarbons 
you know, we're in the easement where we're going, there's similar sized oil pipelines and, and product lines as well. They're, 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 they carry a lot of material um, as well. So, and just, just to the point about the, the Commonwealth and DOOR and their engagement, they're actually down on our site today and they've come for a site visit to have a look at the project so that they can better understand it. And they're liaising with DELP this week, I think, while they're in town as well. So they've come down from Canberra, they've had a look at the project site, they're talking to us and understanding our processes and you know, to help them make a decision you know, sometime next year. Now, probably not directly related, but what about the local council? Does that come into it? Yeah, the local council has planning control, so there is another element of approval, um, which is the planning system. So the council has the planning scheme, which this facility is located within you know, the local government planning scheme. So there will be discussion between council and the minister about how a planning scheme amendment will be put together to allow this facility to occur and whether the council remains as the authority or whether the minister becomes the authority. That, that's very common in these sort of projects, but to your point, yes, absolutely, the council has a planning scheme, sort of coverage and control, right. which is another approval again. Lots of approvals. Yeah, so in that case, is that going to be taking a longer time for final assessment? No, no. the planning scheme, what, Thankfully, over time, governments have got their act together and have things running together now instead of sequential, yep. which used to take a lot of years to get something done. Um, so the planning scheme amendment for this project, which will focus on the development itself, will be prepared at the same time as the EES, and it will go on public exhibition at the same time as the EES. So you're also able to make comment to the panel inquiry that I mentioned before on the planning scheme amendment as well as the EES. So if you had planning, specific planning issues, not environmental issues, you could make a submission under that process. Yep. Can I just one more thing about the technical reference group? Without trying to complicate the process anymore, but as part of putting together this, um, this EES, um, we're working with DELP, as, as Jeff said, and they have convened what's called a technical reference group. And the members of that technical reference group include all those regulatory bodies that are going to have to um, make a decision on whether or not to approve this project, and one of those is the council. So, so there's a, a, a very, very broad range of, of inputs on that technical reference group um, that are looking at the types of studies that we're undertaking um, and, and, and working on that process and overseeing this EES process to ensure that it is comprehensive as it progresses. Is that good universities or, you know? No, no it doesn't, it, it doesn't actually include yeah. technical. No, yeah. it doesn't. There's, there's a, a different area, and Jeff might talk about peer review as well, technical peer review, but this technical reference group, it is, it's primarily um, all those regulatory bodies that, as I said, are going to have to make a decision on the improvements for the project. So it's worth mentioning um, because it does include the council as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Jacqueline. That's a really good point. And just that sort of amplifies, oh, sorry, I'll just come back to you one second, amplifies how much scrutiny these EESs go through because every single technical study and every single chapter of the EES goes to that technical reference group for their department's input. And if they see something they don't like or they think something hasn't been studied thoroughly enough, they will come back to Viva and say, you need to go off and do some more work on this. So it gets scrutinised a lot. Sorry, madam, you had a... Uh, it's OK. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, as far as the health and safety um, thing is concerned, has a compact statement been made yet or is it still being worked on? I mean for the number one for the people at Viva and all the people concerned with the building of this, um, is there anything written at the moment that um, can as, you know, assuage people's worry about it? I'll defer to Rob but studies are underway, there's nothing 
publicly available yet, but the studies are happening. But Rob, you might want to... Yeah, yeah so I think we talked about that earlier. There, there will be safety-specific studies done over the, the coming months as it, during this phase of the engineering. But I think there's a couple of things that we should recognise is that the LNG industry has been around for a long time, 30, 40 years, and there's a, there's a lot of ship movements happening with them every year, and they happen without incident. And there's, so, so that as an industry, it, it is a safe industry and it's tightly controlled and managed. And I think the other thing is that the refinery is already a major hazard facility. So we've got a license to operate an MHF and it's a major hazard facility because of the amounts of hydrocarbons that are processed there and are, and are held there. So having a, an LNG facility alongside the refinery is a good fit because we're already familiar with the uh, the requirements of managing those types of materials and we understand that and our workforce is skilled in it and our engineers are skilled in it so we're we're confident that it'll be a neat add to our existing business so it's sort of still being worked on yeah thank you Fair question and i imagine you guys think about this obviously it's fun, but what if someone wants to blow up the gas facilities. Like, it must be a high level risk if someone wants to, you know, go for a... Yeah, look, as, as, a, as a refinery, <laughs> as a refinery anyway, we're in that situation, to be honest. You know, there's a lot of hydrocarbon there and we've got security protocols in place that we work with the government, which not only involve our site, but it involves how we ship products in. So that can be crude oil, it can be shipping our products out, um, and then this will fit in to that as well. So we're going to have to assess the security of that, there's, there's no doubt. Now, and Australia's got a number of facilities similar to that, whether they're gas... Well, you know, we've got gas plants in Gippsland, we've got gas plants in the Otways, um, just here in Victoria, so... Cool, I know, random question. <laughs> Look, I'm conscious of time and people are obviously needing to go back to work and, and whatever. Um, so I'll really rush through this quickly just to show you, you, you know, we're at these early stages, as I said earlier, of the studies. We're doing 12 months of um, monitoring for the lady that asked that question earlier. So yes, a lot of local data. And what we're trying to do is establish what we call baseline conditions. So what's there now? And that's really important to allow you to assess the impacts of what we're doing on what's there now. So all of this work, the surveys and the temperature and the salinity, sediments and so on, looking at what's there now, forms our base case for how we assess what the impacts will be. So rest assured, there's a lot of technical work being done to establish that baseline condition, if you like, including shorebird surveys. We're, at, we're actually doing shorebird surveys of the Ramsar site and other areas nearer to the, the Viva refinery, etc. So all of that's going on now. Um, so we might just quickly jump to the, I think, the last slide. <coughs> the other thing we're doing is the, the modelling, and we're using a, an accepted model that the EPA and Melbourne Water use extensively for this type of marine modelling. And we've got a, um, a specialist modelling consultant doing that work who are very familiar with the model and... Um, whoops. No, back one, I think it was. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so that, that modelling mentioned up the top there. And the things we're looking at in that modelling are what I've said, how much sea life would be drawn into the gas terminal, how far would the chlorine go in the water in Corio Bay once it comes out of the, the process, and how far would the warm water travel before it reaches background normal conditions in Corio Bay. So... The models will predict what's called a mixing zone for chlorine and water temperature and that will be checked and tested to see how far that goes into the into Corio Bay. And past projects show that those plumes, as we would call them, are pretty restricted. They're fairly small. We expect that they'll probably be restricted to within the, the shipping swing basin that Rob showed you earlier. They don't typically extend very far before they go back to normal, you know, baseline conditions in the bay. So that, that's the sort of work we're doing to have a look at 
what does happen to all those discharges. And then once we know what the discharges are and how far they extend and the concentrations of chlorine and the temperature, we then say, well, what does all that mean for marine species, birds, the food chain, etc., etc., and the Ramsar? So we then bring in the experts who basically say, well, if chlorine is at non-detectable levels within, let's just say, 200 metres of the discharge, we don't think it's going to have an impact on the Ramsar wetland, which is 1.3 kilometres away because it's diluted to the background level by the time it gets to that 200. Or it might say, hey, this is a really big zone and it could potentially have impact. So, Rob, what do we do to redesign to bring that back into a more acceptable discharge? And, and anecdotally from other projects that we've been involved in, we don't think the plumes will be very big, but we're not going to you know, know that until we do the work. So can you see how that fits together? Establish your baseline what's there now, do the sort of the 12 months studies to get all of that, do the modelling and the, the assessment and then have a look at what those things mean for the marine environment. That's our process, if you like. So I'll leave it at that because I'm conscious everyone's probably needing to go, but if you have any questions, I know it's highly technical and I apologise. No, do, please. I'm happy to stay as long as you are. Yeah, I'll if others wanted or need to leave. Wasn't but there one in Western Port Bank that was just, was that, didn't go ahead or something? Was there a gas storage facility? So why, is it, was there environmental impacts, the reasons that it wasn't go, didn't go ahead? A very different environment. The, the Western Port one was inside the Ramsar wetland. So all of Western Port is a designated Ramsar wetland. And the, the company that was developing that wanted to build it inside the wetland, inside Ramsar which was problematic to start with. And it's also, um, what would I say, a more sensitive um, environment in Western Port. Is there an image on the website or something where, at, where the Ramsar website site, site is in Crow Bay and where the facility is yeah. in the building? There's a So for, for you, it's sort of, you know, the closest points are up around, you know, Avalon Beach and Limeburners Bay and in that area. You can see them probably on that little map. <laughs> have you got the same one, Joe? Jo? Have you got the one for the... project in ours is the reuse of our cooling water that we're proposing we back through back through the refinery. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, um, I, th I think th it, it was a very different environment. Western Port is a pretty highly sensitive, it's got a lot of seagrass, mangroves, it's a, a major sort of um, nursery ground for a lot of Victoria's fish species. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty sensitive not disparaging Cryo Bay because no. it's also got <laughs> significant values as well and um, it's just a different environment. So in that context, you had already done a lot of basic research for that potential area to be established that could be related to down here? Only in as much as um, technical things like discharges and so on but the environment's very different. So we would totally disregard the Western Port baseline data because it's not relevant to Cryo Bay. Hence why we're putting so much effort into getting all the data for Cryo Bay because that's where we facility. There'd be no point just using Western Port data for... But it's the same process. The, the, the process is similar except for, as Rob described, the reuse of the... The, the one in Western Port was to discharge directly out of the FSIU back into Western Port, not to recycle it through any facility. Right. Okay. So quite different. Yeah. Different tidal environment, 
different currents, you know, the whole setting is different. And you wouldn't want us to do an environment effect statement where we're using data that's not relevant to the local. No, I was just thinking because it's completely the same industry, it's just the location Correct. that's different. Yeah. The process. process is well understood and well known and it's used all around the world, that's this regasification process. But what are the impacts here or in Peru or in Western Port or in Europe? They're all quite different, of course. Yeah, so you've, you've got an international baseline that you're working from as far as this whole industry is concerned. Yes, because we know what these vessels are and we know what they discharge and we know how much chlorine they use. So we have all of that body of knowledge around the process. But what's important is not the process, it's what the process implications are on your local environment. And talking about impact, I saw you did have some reference to Aboriginal land. Has that been looked at? Yes, very extensively. Have they got an area that overlaps with where you are? Yeah, we have um, engaged with the local Aboriginal group. The Wadawurrung people? Yep. Yeah. And we're working with the RAP, as they're called, and we've actually been out with them on site, walking the whole of the pipeline alignment. And we're doing what's called a cultural heritage management plan, which is where we'll, we're actually doing excavations to see whether there are artefacts in our area of influence. And that work happens with the Indigenous um, representatives from the RAP, who, if we do find artefacts, they make decisions about what to do with them. They may be very minor and they can be recorded and put back, or they might be significant and they can be treated in a different way. Or, as Rob said, we might move the pipeline. If there's something significant that gets found, we might do something different with the pipeline. So, yes, that's all underway. So, so given that the Aboriginal people are the ones who completely understand that this is heritage land, they will be primarily the ones who make comments regarding yes, no? Yep, they're intimately involved. As I say, they're out in the field with the archaeologists doing the surveys. Right. So they're... So they're also at our reference group, so they're seeing the studies. Yep. So not only just the cultural heritage, but every single um, study that's going through. So they're very heavily involved in both the heritage plan but the overall process. Okay. And in Victoria, the, the registered Aboriginal party is effectively, you know, in loose terms, the decision maker. So it's either Heritage Victoria or Aboriginal Victoria, I beg your pardon, or the local registered Aboriginal party. So they are intimately involved and they're totally influential on the decision. But very rarely stop something because, you know, again, back to the example of the pipeline, if something is found in the surveys, we would simply say, well, if that's significant enough to leave in situ and it's important to the Indigenous community, we'll move somewhere else. We'll just redirect around it and preserve that. So usually it's just a negotiation process between the parties to come to that acceptable outcome for everyone. Yep. If you've got more questions, feel free. I can stay here till six o'clock tonight if you want to. I'll <laughs> This is really the beginning of our consultation and we'll be really keen for you to attend other events. We'll be having, um, as you know, community booths and shopping centres. We'll also have specific topic sessions like today. So the next one will be on safety and all of those will be advertised on our websites. Um, so please come along. We've also got a Facebook page that I'd encourage you all to um, follow so you can see the latest news in terms of community events but also outputs of studies and things so please um let's hope this is the beginning of a really important dialogue and excuse me all the data that you've shown us today that's available on your website is it it will be so what we'll do is chris who's making the video will get that all together and put it up um, so you can as a reference point but also if people are unable to attend today yes. they're more than willing to access it and at the same time if there are questions as people are watching it or you think of things after the event please let us know because we're more than happy to have that dialogue yeah there's lots of information on the website 
not only what we've talked about today, but there's other fact sheets. There's our contact details. If you've got questions, send them through that, and we'll get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.